Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study in Matthew. We're at the end of Matthew chapter 13. Uh, let me once again remind you to keep in prayer those that are on our sick list. You know, Rosalind sends that out every midweek and just keep an eye on that and keep those people in prayer. And if you'd like to add someone to the prayer list, if you would just contact Rosalind and she would put that on the prayer list. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the day that we have here, for the lesson that we have. And uh, Father, the words that you have given to us to help us live our lives better for you. Just ask you, Father, that uh, you would help us today as we are here. Be with those that are sick and give them, Father, your blessing. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, there are three dookies out walking in the woods and they come upon some tracks. And the first dookie says, those are deer tracks. And the second dookie says, no, 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 those aren't deer tracks, those are elk tracks. And the third dookie says, you're both wrong. Those aren't uh, either, those are moose tracks. And they're still standing there arguing when they get run over by a train. Okay. I'll let you all you know, stop laughing here, and you know, we'll get started. All right, <clears throat> today's passage that we have is sort of a historical uh, interlude that we have here. Chapter 13, if you remember, contains the great parables of Jesus' teaching here. And as we move on to the next section uh, of Scripture, uh, we're going to look at some of Jesus' great miracles. But today... Uh, passage illustrates our life as followers of Jesus Christ in terms of our situation, our duty, and our hope in the midst of a dark and fallen world. And as we look at this section, I want to warn you in advance, it, 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 uh, it is as scandalous, scandalous and sordid as anything you'll ever see on today's daytime TV, or even now, even our evening TV. And as we look at this section, uh, let me warn you in, in advance that it's going to highlight some remarkable characteristics of the Bible, though. It's going to tell us the truth. It deals with things as they really are. This morning's passage involves three characters. The evil and fearful King Herod. The bold but imprison John the Baptist, and of course, our compassionate and loving Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew's gospel, as you may remember, is the gospel of the king. And it was written primarily uh, to the Jewish uh, people, and in its particular viewpoint of Jesus is as the long-awaited king of the Jews. In the parables of chapter 13, you remember Jesus is the main character. He's the acting agent. He plants the wheat. He uh, has his angels harvest the wheat and the weeds. <clears throat> he buys the field. He buys the pearl. He's the householder with authority. And he asks his disciples, do you understand these things? And, you know, his disciples very naively, as we looked at last week, oh, yeah, yeah, we understand it. So now he and his disciples <clears throat> come, to the, uh, come to Nazareth. And uh, let's read, read there in Matthew chapter 13, verses 50 through 3 through 58. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. And when he had come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said... <clears throat> Where did this man get this, his wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now the interesting thing to me is that this passage, in this passage, is the reaction of the people. Note the, these reactive words. They were astonished. Where did this man get this wisdom? Uh, where did he get these mighty works? Uh, you would think... <coughs> 
that, that, being, that being astonished by him, by recognizing that he had the wisdom and the power, that they would fall down and worship him as their king. But no, no, they dismiss him. Well, he's the carpenter's son. We know his family. He can't be the Messiah. You have to wonder why they had this reaction. Now, there are three accounts of Jesus teaching in the synagogue of Nazareth. And those accounts are found in Matthew, uh, the one we're looking at today, also in Mark, and then in Luke. And R.C. Foster in his gospel commentary, The Life of, of Christ, points out <coughs> that some scholars believe that, uh, that although the accounts in Matthew, Mark, uh, reference the same event, the one in Luke happens much earlier in Jesus' ministry. Now, whether it did or not, I, I don't really know. I don't think anyone can know for sure. But it is rather logical uh, that this is true. The account in Luke takes place shortly after Jesus' baptism and temptation in the wilderness, while Matthew and Mark's accounts seem to be much later in his ministry. But in Luke's account, <coughs> we're given a reason for their reaction. In Luke, it is said that Jesus has handed the scroll of Isaiah and he reads to them from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. And that passage, you see, was clearly understood to be a messianic prophecy, a prediction of what the coming Messiah or the King would do when he came. Now, so far, so good, no complaints, but when Jesus finished reading the scroll and he handed it back to the, to the uh, scribes that were there and he sat down, every eye was upon him waiting to see what he was going to say. <clears throat> and he began with these words. Verse 21. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, hey guys, that's talking about me. I'm the guy Isaiah is talking about. <clears throat> I am the messianic king. And they couldn't accept that. And here, even if, it, even if this was a later account, they remembered those words and still, despite all that he had done, he was still the carpenter's son. So just consider the ways that Jesus had already proven himself before this time. Back in chapter 4, Matthew tells us that Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and the people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and, and paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the, the Capolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. And as you read on in Matthew's gospel, we see that he cleansed a leper uh, in, in the sight of a large crowd. He cured a centurion so servant of his paralysis. He raised Peter's mother-in-law from her sickbed. And as we read further, we see that he exercised his power over the wind and, and the waves. And he demonstrated authority over the demons and proved conclusively that he had the power on earth to forgive sins. You know, he cured a woman of a life-draining flow of blood. He raised a dead girl to life. He gave sight to two blind men. He gave voice to the mute man. Everywhere he went, he demonstrated compassion to people in need. It says he was teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. In chapter 9, verse 35. <clears throat> he even did those things in the midst of those who opposed him. The scribes and the Pharisees, religious leaders of the day, they, <coughs> excuse me, they claimed that he did these miracles because he himself was working in the power of the devil. And yet he made their claims foolish by healing a crippled man on the Sabbath day that, that they had brought before him in order to trap him. And he did it right inside their synagogue. They plotted to kill him for this, and he responded to the threats by withdrawing himself from them and then kept right on healing people elsewhere. 
And even then, they followed him to oppose him and accuse him. And even then, he cast out a demon uh, out of a man and healed him of his blindness and muteness right before their very eyes. And the Pharisees responded by insisting that this proved he was operating by the power of the devil. But the crowds of Galilee were all struck by it all and kept saying, could this be the son of David? That is say, could this be the long-awaited Messiah, the promised king of the Jews? Which leads us <clears throat> to the second king in this passage. And I'm sorry, I am way behind you. The second king in this passage. All these things finally found their ways, you see, to the ears of the king over Galilee, the very monarch, monarch who ruled over the district in which all these things had been happening. And, and the fact that he hadn't heard about these things kind of underscores how uninvolved he really was, what kind of rule, ruler he really was. And the fact that he was so badly misinterpreted them once he heard about them simply shows how spiritually dark his soul was. Matthew chapter 14, verse 1 and 2 we read, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead, and that is why the miraculous powers are at work in him. <clears throat> now this man is known to us in history as King Herod Antipas, Antipas. And it's fascinating that he appears in Matthew's presentation of Jesus as the King of the Jews. Perhaps you'll remember this man's father, Herod the Great, one of the most notorious men in all of history. <coughs> Sorry, I got, I got a lot of this pollen here today. <coughs> he was one of the most not notorious men in all of history. He himself now was not a Jew. He was a foreigner, being of Edomite descendant, that is a descendant of Esau, not Jacob. But he ruled over the Jewish people at a time when our Lord, at the time when our Lord Jesus was born. And it was him to whom the wise men came and asked, where is the one that's been born king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and we have come to worship him. It was he who, out of neurotic fear of this newborn threat to his rule, ordered that every male child in Bethlehem from two years old and under be put to death. And that was only a mere sampling of the, uh, from his career of cruelty. Herod the Great ruled over the Jewish people, but only as Rome allowed him to rule. At first he declared his son Antipater, to be the heir to the throne. But he later changed his mind and made Antipater's brother Archelaus king. After Herod the Great died, the Roman reduced Archelaus's rule to that of Judea and Samaria, and they named his brother Philip as the ruler over the northern district and Antipas as the ruler over Galilee. <clears throat> and it's this last man here who is the Herod of our passage this morning. This man, Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch. Now, Tetrarch means one ruler over a, uh, of a group of four. And he began his rule shortly after Jesus was born and had been ruling for about 32 years at the time of our story. He ruled throughout the time of our Lord's life on earth and his rule uh, ended uh, uh, just a few years after Jesus' crucifixion, a total of basically 37 years. Now, he was the civic ruler over the region in which our, our Lord grew up, where, and he worked and later began his public ministry, and over the region where Jesus, you know, taught the truths of the kingdom of heaven and performed all these wonderful miracles, which makes it so remarkable that Herod Agrippa, as it would seem, or Herod Antipas, didn't even hear the report about the miracles and wonders Jesus had been doing until this point in our story. Luke tells us that he said, I beheaded John, who then is this I hear such things about? The Son of God was walking in the midst of his own kingdom, and yet he was clueless about how about it, and how could he miss such a monumental thing? Sometimes a man's heart, you see, can be so filled with darkness that he can't even see the light when it shines right in front of him. And though Herod apparently didn't know much about Jesus, 
I apologize for that. Forgot to turn the phone off. Though uh, Herod, we got a rough day today, don't we? Though Herod apparently didn't know much about Jesus, he did something about the one who had announced Jesus' is coming. He turned to his servants and he gave his own interpretation of what he heard. This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. And therefore, these powers at work in him, he said this because it was he who had put John to death. Now, Matthew tells the story of this diabolical uh, crime. He says in verse 3 to 4, he goes back into history here, you see. He says, now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. <clears throat> for John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now, the whole family of the Herodians uh, was a very incestuous, uh, immoral Bunch. But Herod Antipas' behavior in this case caused a scandal that was particularly shocking. The wife of his brother Philip, a woman named Herodias, a woman who, by the way, was Herod the Great's granddaughter, the sister of Herod Agrippa uh, that we read about in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, had left Philip and had eloped with Antipas. In other words, Herod Antipas lusted after his sister-in-law while still married, then divorced his wife, and then married Herodias, who was also his relative, and all the while his brother Philip was still living. <clears throat> now there was a provision in the law of God given through Moses that called for a man to marry the widow of his childless brother and raise children through her in his brother's name. That was so that his brother's name would not be blotted out of Israel and that the land that had been appointed to him would not be uh, lost to his descendants. But that's not applicable in this case. Herodias was, was not a widow uh, and Antipas was certainly not doing his brother any favors. In fact, it speaks of behavior that is a great sin in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. You go back to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 16. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. And in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 21, it says, if a man marries his brother's wife, it is an act of impurity. He has dishonored his brother. They will be childless. And the conduct of Herod Antipas then was nothing more than a matter of incestuous lust. And John the Baptist had spoken out against it. And he had dared to go to Herod, perhaps even maybe pointing right at Herodias as he did so, and tell him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now what boldness that took. You know, John no doubt knew what kind of man Herod was, and he knew what Herod was capable of doing to him for this. But as Jesus once asked the crowds about John, what did you go out to see in, in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Matthew eleven seven. No, whoever thought that would have been in for a shock because J John was no flimsy little reed being shaken in the wind. He was a mighty wi uh, wind himself who shook the, the reed. May we be more like him in our day. So John dared to tell Herod what the law of God said. John dared to shine the light on the king's sin. And what was Herod's response to John? Luke in his gospel writes, but when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added to this, this to them all. He locked John, John up in prison. What he did <clears throat> with Herodias was very evil. But once John showed him the truth about his sin from the word of God, what he did to John was even more evil. One of the rights that we are guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States is the, in the very first amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right to the people to peaceful, peacefully, peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. 
Now that's right there in, in the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. The freedom to exercise our religious beliefs, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly are dear rights. And we need to be thankful for them. And we need to exercise them. We need to hold them dear. They can be quickly taken away if we don't. Apparently Herod <coughs> wanted to put John to death. They didn't have the Bill of Rights back there. He, but he wanted to silence the righteous tongue of his and in doing so silence the condemnation he received from the word of God. And Matthew goes on to tell us in verse 5, Herod wanted to kill John but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. I've sometimes heard teachers say that Herod really didn't want to kill John but because he was very interested in John's teachings. That comes kind of from Mark's gospel, but I think when we put Matthew and Mark together, I think we again will see that, uh, that he did it because he was afraid. <clears throat> Men, many people today are just like Herod. They're, they're more afraid of the judgment of men than they are the judgment of God. And here's where we see <clears throat> Herod's uh, uh, messed up. All right, I missed something. Here's where we see <clears throat> Herod's moral fearness and confusion. Herodias also wanted John dead. She evidently had no fear of people or God. But Mark tells us there was a curious draw that John still seemed to have on Herod, and thus Herod prevented her from killing him. Mark in his gospel tells us that because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man, when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. And that's where the, some of the confusion comes in here in the, uh, be, it, between the Gospels. I think it's caused in part because a lot of us were told these accounts from the King James Version. Now, I'm not saying the King James Version is bad, but sometimes when it speaks in the old English phrases, we kind of misunderstand them because they don't exactly mean the same thing today. The King James Version here says that he heard him gladly. Uh, and I think there's a, a real big difference in hearing someone gladly, and he liked to listen to him. Now, again, I'm not putting the King James Version down. I'm just saying that they spoke different English than we do. The King James is written in a very poetical, very formal English courtly language. And I think most people would agree with that. In fact, that's why people love the King James. They, they love the beauty of the language. And I certainly can't argue with that, but here's the issue. The original text were not written in a royal or formal Greek. They were written in Koine Greek, the common language of the people. The educated and intellectual and academic community spoke a classical Greek. But God wanted his word to be available and accessible to everyone. And he chose the common language of the daily Koine Greek. And that causes us to misunderstand some of these passages of scriptures like this one. And, but aren't some people in their sinful and wicked hard, hardness of heart, they still kind of like to hear the truth? Not, not they can't accept it, but they like to maul over it and dissect it to see if they can find some lie in it, some loopholes that will justify their behavior. They hear the truth and they hate it, and they rail against it, and fight it, and argue against it with all their being. And yet, because the Spirit of God continues to convict them of its truth, they're, they're still hearing, they're still drawn to hear more, but they're always lingering and loitering near the truth, but never fully embracing it unto life. Truly, as the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure. Who can understand it? How long John had to languish in prison with Herod vacillating back and forth, it's hard to say. But it was plain that God's purpose for John had been completed, that his work on earth had come to an end, and he had not only pointed faithfully to the law in order to declare sin, but he also pointed faithfully to Jesus and declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin 
of the world. And so now the time of John's release would come, and so, he, uh, and so had Herodias' oppor opportunity against him. It was Herod's birthday. He threw this great feast and all the nobles, high and uh, officers and all the chief men of Galilee came and the wine, no doubt, flowed very freely and heavily. And it's then that a supporting character in our story is introduced. History knows her as Salome. She was the daughter of Herodias and of the, uh, and of the husband that she had left for Antipas. Matthew tells us on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guest and pleased Herod. In fact, the king, uh, the, this kind of thing, of course, was, was done by, was never done by members of the royal household. I mean, dancing girls in those days, just as they are today, were to considered to be rather immoral. And though we're not told what sort of dancing Salome did, we can be pretty sure that uh, it wasn't ballet. I mean, Herod was quite frankly a liquored up, dirty old man. And so when the dance was over, he made a drunken and I suspect a somewhat lustful promise to the girl. It so pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked for. Mark tells us just how outlandish his promise was. He says, it says in Mark, Mark 6, 22 and 23, he said, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. That's a pretty big promise. <clears throat> you just stop and consider how much this man despised the heritage of Israel, that he would give half of his kingdom to a girl who danced for him and pleased him. Now, Apparently, the girl consulted with her mother, and we read of what is certainly one of the most notorious requests, certainly the most notorious dancer's tip in all of history. Verse 8 through 11, prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. And the king was distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. And the scripture tells us that Herod was sorry, but he wasn't sorry enough to repent. Herod was more concerned about keeping his drunken, hasty promise to the girl than he was about taking the life of the prophet of God. You can almost hear him. I made a vow, and by golly, I'm going to keep it. My reputation is at stake. Why, if I don't go through with this, I'll be the laughing stock of all the people in Galilee. He was more concerned, you see, about the admiration of men than he was about damnation from God. And so he sent his guards and John to, to get John the Baptist, the man whom Jesus had said, uh, among those born of women, uh, there had not risen anyone greater. And John the Baptist was suddenly ushered into heaven. That's the last we hear of Salome and Herodias in the New Testament. However, Salome had been forever portrayed in art and poetry and theater as the epitome of the immoral, seductive woman. And their story explains why Herod was so fearful at the news of Jesus and the marvelous works that he had been doing among the people. <clears throat> He was irrational because of guilt and fearful that it was John the Baptist risen from the dead. But it's then that J Jesus comes back from the story. John's disciples came, it says, and took his body and, and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Now, J as we conclude this story, I want you to know that Jesus loved John. G in fact... John was Jesus' earthly cousin. And though we don't know the details of Jesus' or John's childhood, it's very possible they spent some time together growing up. They were about six months apart, particularly on the annual trips that Jesus' family made to Jerusalem for the Passover. And though there's no doubt that as the Son of God, Jesus knew the end that was in store for John from the very beginning, I nevertheless believe that it still grieved Jesus deeply when the end finally came. Matthew goes on to tell us when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. It may be that Jesus felt the loss of John when he was told of the execution and 
that he had just needed to be alone for a while. It may be that because Herod had begun to wonder if Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead, that Jesus and his disciples were now in danger and needed to get to safer regions. Mark gives us an even further, a fuller view of the story when he reports that the disciples of John told the apostles and that the apostles then told Jesus and that Jesus then said to them in Mark 6, 31, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, whether it was because Jesus wanted to be alone for a while or because he was sensitive to the needs of the disciples, might have for safety and some peace and rest after this sad news, or most likely because all these needs, they got into a boat and got away for a little time of solitude. Now, I'm grateful for this picture that we have of our Savior. He walked upon this earth in human flesh, and yet he was, it's, uh, and yet he still affirmed the human need for rest and comfort. What a joy it is to serve a master of such as him. As it turned out, <clears throat> whatever rest they sought didn't last long. We're going to look at that next week. But here's another wonderful thing about our Savior. He wasn't uh, angry about that. He didn't lash out because rest and solitude were taken away from him. He reacted as he always does toward those who hunger uh, for him and seek him. He felt compassion toward them, them and welcomed them to himself and loved them. And Matthew tells us, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. See, the Holy Spirit saw fit to lead Matthew to include the scandalous, grotesque story in his gospel account of Jesus. The Word of God, uh, word of God just doesn't try to shield us from the truth of things. It lets us see, see things as they really are. But it does this so that we might know the things we need to know in order to better follow our wonderful Savior in this dark world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God and Father, I thank you for this story about Jesus and the compassion that he shows. The story, Father, about John and his bravery in the face of, of sinfulness. I just pray, Father, that we might portray both of these uh, reactions in our lives, these passions in our lives, the most bravery and compassion. Just ask you, Father, to, to lead us to be like Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us here today for our Bible study. Mm -hmm.